Hey church, happy post-Easter Sunday. Pastor Corey here with Court Street Christian Church, and I'm super glad that you are here joining me uh, on this uh, wonderful sermon that we get to share in today. Uh, I want to start with a question. It's a playful question. What are your nicknames? And uh, if you received a nickname in middle school or later, you know, maybe edit it before you throw it online. Keep it like PG-rated people, you know what I'm talking about? And so, uh, but, uh, you know, we accumulate nicknames throughout our lives, don't we? I'd love to hear you rifle off a few of them in the comment section. Or if you're sitting with somebody right now, you could turn to them and just acknowledge some of your nicknames that you've had. So take just a moment and do that, and I will reveal some of my childhood nicknames in just a moment. Well, how many of you uh, saw the are familiar with the old Little Rascals show? There's a there's a character in that show named Spanky, and because my last name is Spangler, all throughout my life people have called me Spanky. It's true for my brother Dustin too. He's got the same last name, and so everybody calls him Spanky. Calls me Spanky. We're the Little Rascals, apparently, if you can believe that. But I'll tell you the childhood nickname that I still growl inside about. I just get a little angry, okay? It makes the blood boil. You wouldn't want to see the Hulk when he's angry. You know what I'm talking about? But for some reason, people for a while in grade school thought it was the funniest thing to call me Apple Cory. Doesn't that just sound lame? If, in fact, if it's one of you out there and you're one of the people that did it when I was in grade school at Washington Elementary here in Salem, Oregon, you know what? God forgives you, but I don't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but, uh, but Apple Corey, come on. It just seemed so cheesy, and I tried to ignore it, and I'd growl about it, and I tried to pray it away and all this kind of stuff, but somehow, hey, Apple Corey, your name's Corey, Apple Corey. Aren't nicknames great? <laughs> well, um, there's a, a character in the scripture, one of the 12 original disciples. So this is an important person, and uh, his name is Thomas. And uh, Thomas accumulated an unfortunate nickname because of an incident that happened in his life. He wasn't really referred to uh, this way in the Bible, but after the Bible, all throughout Christian history, really, he's been referred to as what? Doubting Thomas, right? Thomas the doubter, Thomas the skeptic, but most often referred to as Doubting Thomas. So let's uh, take a look and uncover together the history of where this unfortunate nickname came from. This is uh, John chapter 20, by the way. We're going to be in John's gospel, the 20th chapter, for most of this. And so here's where Doubting Thomas uh, becomes a terrible nickname for him. So now Thomas, also known as Didymus. Remember, in this time, they often had two names. They'd have a Hebrew name, a Greek name. That's all this is about here. So Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. You see, Jesus has risen. He's risen from the dead. He's been appearing to different disciples. And he has this dramatic uh, appearance to, to some of the disciples, which I'll share with you in just a moment. But this is where Thomas comes into play. He missed that encounter. He wasn't there for that big reveal. So they're telling him all about it. They're saying, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe, he says. So Thomas is pretty, um, he's pretty adamant here, isn't he? And uh, he's, he's in this spot with the disciples of, um, of they're excited about something, and he's just not believing it. He's just not believing it. Now, for me, this is kind of a, an unfortunate nickname for him to earn from this one encounter. You know, we don't know that much about Thomas, to tell you the truth. We know that he's one of the original 12. In fact, we only have 12 verses in the entire Bible that mention him specifically by name. Uh, there's an encounter with him where, uh, where he's mentioned as Lazarus is about to be risen from the dead, resurrected by Jesus, and he actually has this bold proclamation of faith in that moment. Another time in the scripture, he asks a really good question. 
And then most of the other times he's just mentioned more as in a roll call that he's there at these different significant events. And so to have these, these, this um, body of work that is just little glimpses of who Thomas is, to have this one define him is just unfortunate. But it's almost kind of hypocritical. Because when we look back on what took place after the resurrection, nobody really believed it. Everybody was incredulous. In fact, I'll jump over to Luke's account of what was taking place after the resurrection. The women who originally went to the tomb, we just talked about this last week on Easter Sunday, when they came back and, and they were talking to the disciples about it, look what it says. The disciples did not believe the women. They didn't believe it because their words seemed to them like nonsense. We don't get it. Furthermore, you remember that incident that, uh, that I was talking about where Jesus appeared to some of the disciples, but Thomas wasn't there? You know, it was actually this uh, kind of clandestine meeting. They were in this locked room because they were afraid that the Jewish leaders were going to start to persecute them. And so they were afraid and they were hunkered in and there's all this, you know, uncertainty about things. And suddenly Jesus miraculously appears to them. And it freaks them out. This is also from Luke's gospel. Here's what happens when Jesus appears to them. These other disciples, Thomas isn't with them. Jesus says, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. He actually says the very thing that uh, Thomas is going to talk about. And my feet, it's me. They're not believing that it's him. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And when he had said this, he actually shows them his hands and his feet, and they still did not believe. They're still doubting. It says this is because of joy and amazement. They're just, they're just shell-shocked from the whole thing. But somehow, even though everybody wasn't getting it, even though everybody wasn't believing somebody else's account of it, when Thomas objects in this moment, we give him the label Doubting Thomas. And you know, I could see him getting kind of annoyed with that nickname. Maybe he was a more humble guy than I was, but if you know, if somebody comes up and starts calling me Apple Corey today, I'll still just growl a little bit inside. And if I was Thomas, and as I'm traveling around spreading the good news of Jesus under threat from this and from that, and people are coming up to me and going, wait a minute, are you, are you that Thomas? You know, the Thomas that like doubted and said the whole thing, man, you looked like, you looked like such an, yeah, we just call you Doubting Thomas. Are you the Doubting Thomas? You know, I'd probably say something like, yeah, that was me. I saw Jesus, and I'm about to send you to see him. Now shut up and forget that nickname. But uh, maybe Thomas was more gracious than I am, and maybe I've been watching too many action movies. But let's talk a little bit. <laughs> let's transition here a little bit, and let's talk a little bit about doubt. Because I was always um, conditioned and always believed that doubt was something that was a very negative thing. It was sort of the antithesis to faith. In fact, let's look at just kind of some common definitions. Maybe you think of uh, doubt and belief in similar terms, but doubt is this place of uncertainty. It's a lack of conviction about something. It's a place of being skeptical. It's a common way to think about doubt. And kind of a common definition of belief, which sometimes we might use the word belief or faith or something along those lines, but belief is the complete trust that something is true. It really has this element of certainty. I believe this. I'm so certain of it. I would bet my life on it. And so you have this uncertainty of doubt contrasted with this certainty of belief. You have this lack of conviction with this complete trust. And so you have these opposing forces and maybe for you, belief and doubt have been talked about as opposing forces. Is that true? Have our belief and doubt actually opposing forces, though, is the question that I want to ask as we look at Thomas's life and as we invite God to look at this area of our lives as well. Well, as I got to spit, uh, sit with this passage this week and I got to study a bit on it, I, uh, I was looking at the words that are used in this encounter with Thomas. And a key word, which is actually a key word throughout all of the New Testament, uh, a key word for this engaging with God, engaging with the Jesus way of life, is the word belief. But the biblical definition is just a little bit different than the common definition that we often use. The, uh, the Greek word in the New Testament that's used for believing, it pops up all over the place, all through the Gospels. Jesus uses it all through the rest of the New Testament. It's everywhere. But it's this word, this Greek word, pistuo. 
pistuo. And it's a verb. It's an active believing. It's not just a noun describing something that you're separate from. It's something that you're actually doing. And look at the way that it's talked about. It's talked about as being persuaded to trust or have confidence in something or someone. It's a little more approachable definition than the way we often think about it. In fact, let me put them both up here just so you can kind of contrast. This is biblical believing, to be persuaded, to trust or have confidence in something or someone. Notice this keyword here that you're persuaded. You're weighing evidence or you're seeing something or accumulating testimonies that are building your confidence or your trust in something. Whereas that common definition of belief is just this complete trust that something is true, this certainty that cannot be shaken. And you know, there's a real beauty in that. And we often have moments where we'll have that type of belief, but I'll submit to you for your consideration today, a lot of life is more lived in this definition right here, the biblical definition. And so, Brings me to my second question for you. We're going to have some fun with this. It hopefully will uh, will redeem Thomas a little bit in your eyes, and it'll also help us redeem this idea of doubt and belief. But could belief and doubt actually be partners? What if they actually have this relationship and they go together and they accomplish something good? Well, let me show you something that was helpful for me as I was considering this this week. Is I believe that doubt and belief, and this just isn't just Corey, there's plenty of philosophers out there, there's plenty of biblical examples, I'll show you a few in a minute, but there's this symbiotic relationship. These two things are kind of dependent on each other, and they sort of fuel each other in a way. That our doubt actually fuels our belief, and our beliefs can lead us to a place of doubt, and so they're, they're feeding each other in this relationship. You know, as I was thinking about this, it's often my doubts that propel me to really examine and to seek out what I really believe about something. It fuels it, doesn't it? And oftentimes it's my beliefs that over time, as life changes, as my experiences happen, uh, doubts start to creep in, and that helps me to refine those beliefs even more. And so we kind of go around and around on this thing. And so they're, they're each feeding the others in something that, uh, that seems rather healthy to talk about it in this way. You know, as you look at this, the main thing that I believe triggers the activation of this cycle for us is our life experiences. It's our life experiences. You've got some doubts and because they've accumulated in your life because of some life experiences, so you set out to figure out the resolution of them. Well, what do I believe? What are my values? What is good? What is the meaning of life? All this stuff. And when you're in your place of belief and all of a sudden life interrupts your beliefs with something that doesn't fit in a nice little bow, that activates our doubts. And we go on this process again of discovering with God and with others how we're going to relate and reconcile what's happened in our life with our beliefs and our doubts. You know, um, when someone that you love announces something that doesn't fit exactly in your belief system, and so you're suddenly looking at this person and you're going, well, I had this belief, but now this person is saying this, and I love them. How do I reconcile these things? You come to this place of doubt and belief refinement, your life experience interrupts. You know, sometimes somebody will ask you a question and you've got these beliefs that maybe you've grown up around and so you've carried them and you've got these things that you talk about and this way that you, uh, you, you uh, discuss your faith with people and then somebody kind of starts to pick at you about it or to say, well, that just didn't work for me and some doubt enters in and you begin to refine your beliefs. You have this life experience that interrupts. So, I want you to hear this. This is important because we would always call doubt a negative thing if it weren't for what I'm about to tell you right now. I don't think that it is a negative thing because I believe that what I'm about to show you is true, and that's this. Doubt does not always equal disbelief. Remember, they're they're oftentimes fueling each other, aren't they? And if they can form this friendship, they can actually become this life source uh, within us, within our philosophies, within our relationship, 
with people within how we view and experience God. And so doubt doesn't always equal disbelief. They can be two different things. I can still believe and carry my doubts. That's where there's things where I go, well, I don't know how that works out. That doesn't mean I don't believe this still. For a little fun, I'll, um, I'll uh, quote here Frederick uh, Beekner. He's a Presbyterian minister, author, speaker. He says this. This is great. Some of you are just going to love this. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. <laughs> Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. Isn't that a great quote? Well, when we look at the scripture, in fact, I'll, I'll invite you to consider really any, um, any character from the Bible, any person who's lived and that we have this record of their life through the scriptures. I believe as you look at them through this lens of doubt relating with faith, you'll see it in every single one of them. It's really a common theme. But oftentimes for me, when I think about doubt, it feels like a betrayal of God or it feels like a betrayal of the faith, a betrayal of the the community of believers. But what if it wasn't? What if doubt and belief actually worked together? You know, as I was considering this and considering the events that we focused on in the last couple of weeks here, I was thinking of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and as he was as he was praying, if you look at it through this, um, through this lens, I'm not going to unpack this too much for you today, but you, you have this incredibly vulnerable encounter between Jesus and the Father where I don't know that I would say he was doubting, but he, he was coming up against his beliefs, his philosophy that, you know, we've put together this plan, God. I'm going to go on this rescue mission for people. I'm going to be sacrificed and we're going to we're going to do all this and then I'll be raised from the dead and as the hour is getting closer he comes to God and he and it's like he's saying I know we agreed to this and is there another way but he doesn't let go of his belief or his trust he says I still trust you but if it's if it's possible is there I know we we looked at this but is there any other way that this cup could be taken from me so even in the life of Christ you see this refinement that's actually Um, making the story more vibrant. But one other character that really popped for me this week as I was considering this relationship was I was uh, reminded of Jesus' cousin, that's um, John the Baptist. You remember the guy who wore like wild clothes and ate locusts and he lived out in the wild and he was was this big booming kind of gregarious presence that was baptizing people and shouting, you know, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And he he was preparing, he was stirring people up to be prepared to meet Jesus the Messiah. And uh, in all of his boldness, I mean, this guy just comes through the scripture as this bold presence, and he's, he's out there, and he's talking to the religious leaders, and he actually has this, this wonderful intimate moment with Jesus where he gets to be the one who baptizes Jesus, and this miracle of seeing this dove come down from heaven, this, uh, this a voice coming from heaven, it's, uh, it's really quite a spectacular thing. He lived through that, and... Um, and John was the guy who was so humble too. He, you know, when Jesus' followers started to increase and people were asking him about it, kind of, hey, John, are you jealous? Or what are you going to do here? He just says, you know what? He must increase and I must decrease. And John in his boldness would, uh, would actually confront a, a government official about some immorality in his life and he'd be thrown in prison. And uh, after all of that boldness, after everything that he'd been through, after the affirmation of baptizing Jesus and seeing all this, when he's in prison, he actually starts to have some doubts. And he, he reaches out to some of his, his disciples and he says, will you go to this, this Jesus guy? And he says, will you ask him, are you the one or are we to expect another? And it's this really just vulnerable, honest moment of doubt from somebody who's who's done all this, and now he, he probably is sensing the end of his life coming, that he's not going to likely get out of prison and preach more like he did, and his, his, the, the clock is ticking down from him, and doubts creep in for him. And it's, um, it's really quite a, quite a beautiful story. You can find it in Luke chapter 7. Look it up after the message. But uh, when these disciples of John's come to Jesus, he's in the midst of healing all these people. And... Uh, and he responds to them. He doesn't say, well, go tell uh, John to suck it up and just believe. You know, he just needs to deal with it or get over it. Or, yeah, I'm him. 
get, you know, get out of my way. He, he's healing all these people and he, and he says to them, just go tell John what you see, that the lame are, are made well, that the blind can see, that the dead are raised to life. All the things he's saying that are prophesizing real life experiences happening that's affirming the things John believes in. It's this tender uh, moment of affirmation where Jesus says, you've got some doubts? Let me show you what's happening in life. Go tell John that it's going to be okay. So all of that, here we go. We've got the table set. Let's jump back to the redemption of Thomas, the relief from his, uh, his terrible nickname of Doubting Thomas. You know, as we consider what he was going through in this encounter and we try to climb into what was at stake for him, it really was probably quite a bit. You see, Thomas had had his hopes sky high. He had left his family and his career to follow Jesus. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He had believed so much to, to sacrifice financially and sacrifice family relationships. He'd invested three years of his life. It was one of those types of investments, too, to say this guy is the guy when he was crucified and he turned out not to be. That would have made him pretty much, and the other disciples, the laughing stock. You know, something of ridicule. Hey, we're going to follow the next guy that uh, comes up and says he's the Messiah, you know? And so he's, he's in this no kidding situation where he's invested three years of his life and he actually believed, he truly believed that Jesus was going to restore Israel. And so to have spent three years with someone, to have sacrificed greatly, and then to have n- experienced that person being publicly tortured to death like he had slid all the chips across the table he'd given his heart to this thing and he had seen the worst possible outcome of course he's skeptical of course he's a little bit guarded and he's going I don't know I would need to see it for myself before I could start to hope again before I could start to believe again it's all been such a loss and so let's jump back to the story here and see this dramatic encounter between Thomas and Jesus. So after Thomas's big big proclamation, I won't believe it unless I see it and can touch his wounds, it's a week later. The disciples are in the house again. This time Thomas is with them, the scripture says. And although the doors were locked, again Jesus comes and stands among them. Somehow he miraculously just comes in, ta-da, it's this cool surprise moment. And he says to them, peace be with you. This exciting greeting, all of a sudden he's there. This must have been quite a moment. And then he singles out Thomas. And you know, again, Jesus could have been condemning. He could have been like, did you miss the three years of teaching that I gave you, Thomas? Or did you miss the sacrifice? Did you miss all of this stuff? Or hey, where were you when I was up there and all the disciples scattered? He could have been holding on to a record of wrongs. But look at the compassion and love of Jesus for one of his disciples, Thomas. He singles him out to just say, hey, you need to put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand. You can put it into my side. And then he says, stop doubting and believe. Now, I'll tell you something here. Again, as I was researching this passage and connecting with it this week, I realized I don't really like this last little line here, the way it's translated in the New International Version. Some of the other versions of the Bible that you may have, the other translations, they may actually put this first part as a question. And I think that's a more appropriate way to do it, where it would say something along the lines of, are you going to continue in your unbelief? Or are you going to believe? Or now do you believe? And so instead of him saying something dismissive like, oh, Thomas, stop doubting, it's actually this question of saying, look at right here. Okay, here I am now, Thomas. Are you going to continue in your unbelief? Or are you now going to step over into the place of believing? And it's, um, for me, it's a great moment for Thomas because the truth is, if Thomas had just, you know, gone along with the crowd and other people had said something he's like cool I'll just go with it even though I don't really believe it we wouldn't really have a lot of respect for him also in this moment when he's when life experience of having Jesus right there has now activated that whole doubt belief paradigm for him if he just crossed his arms and said I'm going to the place of denial I still just don't believe it we'd be like oh the story of Thomas is a tragedy But Jesus says, here I am. 
you said you needed this. Uh, are you going to persist in your unbelief or are you going to believe? And look at the result. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Remember the other disciples earlier in the other encounter, it says they actually poked at him and they still didn't quite believe it and all this stuff. In fact, Jesus had to eat with them later. He's like, look, I'm eating. I'm not a ghost or anything. But Thomas, after just hearing Jesus's voice and being acknowledged in this way, he's not doubting Thomas, is he? He just says to him, my Lord and my God, he's back. He believes. He's had his doubts and they've fueled him to this point of a belief that is really precious and beautiful. I was uh, considering this in my own life and uh, so often, even today, I find myself, when I go to a place of doubts, feeling like that is a very shameful thing. And God has me on this journey of recognizing and changing that to where I view that as actually an invitation that God's stirring up something in my life that's being refined into an even more worthwhile belief. I don't know if this is true for you, but I often experience this in myself and with other people, that the highs of, of belief or these moments of epic faith that we sometimes get in our life, sometimes they're honestly followed by the deepest valleys of doubt and fear. And uh, I had one of those experiences a few years back. It was 2010, and I was, I was on retreat in Colorado, and I had one of those life-changing encounters with God where it was, it was the love of God was more real to me than anything, than even my own body. It was something that had saturated the whole universe, and I just had this belief and this confidence in it that, would, that had changed everything. It was this beautiful moment, and I remember... After a couple days, as I was getting ready to leave Colorado and I was going to be heading back to Salem, I had a couple of young daughters and I had my bride at home and I was eager to see them and I was eager to embrace them with this, this new freedom that I just felt to love and to, and to, um, and to just be saturated in the love of God. I was, I was eager to just share that with them and to, and to see them again. And all of a sudden this very stark moment of doubt and fear comes into my soul. I was in this just epic high and all of a sudden I was in the place of terror and I was just like, you know, uh, I might not make it back to Salem. They might not ever get to experience, what if I get into a car crash? And I I just went into this whole prayer thing with God and I was all just uh, anxious about it. And and I didn't get the answer of, Corey, you're definitely going to make it back to Salem. What I, what I actually experienced from God was more of the assurance of, you know, Corey, sometimes car crashes do happen. There's, there's bad things that do happen in this life. Uh, but I want you to just know this, that you can trust me. I love your kids and your wife even more than you do. And so through that, that process of wrestling and that process of being afraid and of doubting and wanting something from God, I got to this place where I was like, that's enough. I I do believe that God loves them more than me, and I do believe and trust God that even if I don't make it back, that it will be okay. It'll be okay for me, and it will be okay for them. So the way that John um, finishes this story up, it's just so... um, so beautiful. It makes the whole point of what we're discussing here just, it gives me some real clarity about it. After this whole thing, Jesus has this statement. He tells them, you know, you've seen me and you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have also believed. You know, sometimes we don't get the ability to actually touch something. Our, our faith comes, um, comes from a different place. And then he, John goes on to say this summary statement. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his, of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these ones... These miracles, these stories, these things that I've just put in here before you, he says, I've written these that you may believe, that you may be persuaded to place your trust and your confidence in Jesus. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, by by being persuaded and placing your trust and your confidence, you may have life in his name. Well, we know from uh, 
historical records and church tradition that uh, Thomas went on to become a missionary from the early church. In fact, um, he spent a lot of his missionary work heading out to the east from Jerusalem. Uh, He's known now as the patron saint of India, and so his evangelistic efforts took him quite a ways to persuade people that Jesus is the Messiah, that there is a God who came to earth, sacrificed on our behalf, rose from the dead, a God who even when you doubt after walking with him for three years, he approaches you and says, come do what you need to do. Come and see, it's really me. Thomas was the bearer of that very powerful testimony and it had an effect on the world that's still bearing fruit today. So, I don't know what this has stirred up for you, but I hope it's got your faith spinning and your mind just churning over things. I hope you have a conversation with somebody about what is the relationship between doubt and belief in your life. And hopefully today, um, we've brought a little redemption to a biblical character that got an unfortunate nickname, and really, he was undeserving of that because so much more was going on for him And so much more happened through his life. Amen? Well, let me pray over you. And um, let's bow our heads, bow our hearts. God, um, I find just a lot of uh, relatability. And I find a lot of inspiration from the honesty in the life of Thomas. Uh, I also, God, am just refreshed. I was so refreshed this week to see the tender way that Jesus after all that he'd been through, after all that he taught his disciples, in this moment uh, of skepticism, he doesn't condemn, but he actually moves towards Thomas and loves him and invites him to, to take whatever he needs to prove that he is who he is. And Lord, I pray that, um, I pray that that miracle would happen in each of our lives, God, that uh, whatever it is that's causing us to be in the place of disbelief or distrust for you, or whatever's making us run away from our doubts so fearfully or withhold the honesty of our prayers from you, Uh, Lord, would you very gently and lovingly and boldly reach into those areas of our lives and in your compassion bring healing. Lord, we want to be persuaded that the universe is not a terrible place. We want to be persuaded that the universe is like the Jesus that we talk about, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that is good. We love you, God. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' good name I pray, amen. Well, hey, church, it's a delight to get to share these things with you. Uh, We'd love for you to connect with us. You can reach out to us. Uh, Don't forget, we now have in-person service happening as well, so that's an option as you get more comfortable, as you're able to join us here in Salem, Oregon in person. Do uh, follow the registration links online. Uh, we're hoping to fill those ser- that service up and then add more services. And so we're, uh, we're super excited to connect with you. In fact, there will be some contact information up here on the screen in just a moment. You're welcome to email us, reach out to us with your questions. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. God bless you. See you next week.